I had lost my friendships that I had all throughout high school. I had lost the relationship that I thought was going to go somewhere and went nowhere. This cool army soldier fasana that I was putting on to everyone was now lost as well. I was trying to be the coolest kid I could and be liked in the best way I could. This involved just never ending trying the next thing, whether that was a drug, whether that was an alcohol, or that was sexual pleasure. I just was never satisfied. It was it was literally like trying to chase the wind. When my brother received Christ and accepted Jesus as a savior, he actually came home. I want to say it was actually that weekend he came home and he shared the gospel with our entire family. But I'd say about a year after that day was the first time that my brother sat me down and he shared the gospel with me. He laid out the Romans road very clearly and I was trying my absolute best to understand it because I, just, I cared for my brother, I respected him. There was nothing within me that could understand why he would stop living this party lifestyle and this lust lifestyle and leave it all for what this thing that he was talking about. I just couldn't understand it. That was the first time that I heard the gospel but I didn't understand it in that moment. I was in a really rough spot. I was deployed and I didn't have anyone. I didn't have anyone to turn to anymore. So I sat down with this chaplain who was a Christian. This chaplain was the first person that I remember that cared enough about me to say, Colin, I don't think you're a Christian. From that, I was like, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? He was like, well, you need to believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins and rose from the grave, and you need to place your faith in him and you need to repent from your sin. And I remember hearing that way more clearly than the first time that my brother shared with me. In good faith, I believe, got baptized uh, there on deployment, and then I started reading the Bible. I started reading the Bible to prove myself to God that I could be a Christian, that I could fix my life and um, turn things around in my own strength. It was just six months of reading the word out of grit and out of self-will, and it was so tiring. I was, I was exhausted. Our chaplain, he was given this sermon on just foundations of prayer and crying out to God in times of need. And I remember walking into the chapel service and I was thinking if, if this doesn't resonate with me, then I'm, I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel and I'm giving up on, on this thing that I tried to do and I went out at it's like 1 or 2 a.m. I just said, God, I need something. And as I was sitting there and about to walk inside, this silhouette in the sky completely formed into a perfect person. You could see the head, you could see the arms, and you could see the legs. And I'm sitting there, and at this point in time, my heart started beating really fast. I started getting really sweaty palms, and this silhouette started walking across the sky. It, it literally started walking across the sky and I started just bawling. And so clearly to this day, and one of the biggest reasons and encouragements that keeps me going in life today is audibly hearing that was one of my angels and I'm letting you know that it's okay and I got you. And in that moment, six months of wrestling with the Bible and the Word of God, I understood the grace of God. I saw a huge need when I was in the Crossroads Church in Paradigm last year, and that was a bunch of men who were not being discipled. And I saw these guys, and I was praying, and I just honestly just became super burdened on behalf of them that they weren't experiencing what it is like to get discipled because I had two guys who one discipled me one-on-one -on -one, and that was such a joy just to learn from an older Christian and then I had another guy who discipled me in a group and a bit more emphasis on practical ministry aspects and and that's what I'm doing now. There is no greater joy than knowing that the eternal investment of spending your time on discipling men and women goes on past yourself. And, and I would argue that's when life gets really exciting. Glory be to God. Amen.
Never get tired of hearing the stories of life change, church. Jesus changes lives. Colin, thank you for sharing your story about how you found Jesus, how Jesus changed your life. We're praying for many, many more over and over again. Hey, here's some other good news. We're launching the Johnson County campus today. Let's give it up for them right now. So exciting. A lot of renovation will go on upstairs this year, but they're starting to meet downstairs right now. Hey, our vision, it's not easy, but it is simple, all right? It's simple, not easy. We want to multiply gatherings in new places and new spaces to reach new people that are far from God. We're doing it globally. We're doing it right here locally. And that should be something for every single one of us to be a part of something that God is doing that will echo and ring forever and ever for all of eternity. That is why Jesus came 2,000 years ago. And we're getting ready for our Super Bowl Sunday, our weekend comes every year, Resurrection Weekend, as we celebrate the greatest event in all of human history, that Jesus died for our sin, but he rose from the dead. And so four weeks from today is Easter weekend, and get ready for Easter. We're gonna be in a short series in the next four weeks about the life of Christ, the last week of his life, and some of the significant events in the last week of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything he did from the moment he came was about being living proof of a loving God to a watching world. And beginning with Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the last week of Jesus' life was love on display. And that's what we're calling this series, Love on Display. And that's what we're trying to do at Abundant Life. We're in something called the Irresistible Campaign, year two of a two-year run of ministry we're calling Irresistible. And what we're trying to do is put God's love on display in irresistible ways. And that's why Jesus came. He was God's love on display in irresistible ways. And everything he does in some way was an expression, a demonstration of God's love for me and you. Ending with the crucifixion and the resurrection that can change everything for everybody. Luke chapter 19, that week begins with what we call Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Let's read what it says in Luke 19 and verse 28. It says this. And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet. Now, there are two little villages just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, Both of them inside two miles from Jerusalem. They kind of sat on the Mount of Olives. I hope to someday take you there. We're trying to go back to the Holy Land. Every time we try to go, we plan a trip, something blows up. But one year from now, God willing, if nothing else, you know, gets in the way, we're taking another trip to the Holy Land and you get to stand in the very spot where these events happen in Luke chapter 19. I really pray that we get to go and some of you get to see what happened and see it personally. Listen, your faith becomes sight and how you read these passages will change forever. On the Mount of Olives, two little villages, And these villages give us a prophetic foreshadow of very significant events that's going to happen that week. The first village is Bethphage. It means house of unripe figs. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus will see a fig tree. It will appear to have life. It has leaves, but it has no fruit. He curses that fig tree. That fig tree goes dormant instantly. It appears to die. Why? Because it had life but no fruit. Prophetically, he's picturing the life of the nation of Israel. The fig tree in Scripture is a symbol of the national life of Israel. They're about to reject their king. They're going to crucify their Messiah. And because of that, it was prophesied the Jews would be scattered abroad among other nations for century after century. The fig tree would go dormant. It would die. But Jesus also promised in Matthew 24 that one day that fig tree would come back to life, that fig tree that died and went dormant would put on leaves again, it would be a super sign that the second coming was near, and we know that happened in 1948. And in some way, him passing through Bethphage is a foreshadow of what's about to happen, house of unripe figs. Now, the little sister village right next to it was Bethany. This was the village where his friend Lazarus died. You remember Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 12, it was in this little village. 
And this village, Bethany, it means house of suffering or house of affliction because we know how this week is going to end. It's going to end in the passion, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And in fact, he was going in to the house of suffering. These people are going to embrace him as the Messiah. But by the end of the week, they're going to cry, crucify him, crucify him. Isaiah 53 and verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He is bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace would be upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. He would suffer for our sin. He passes through Bethphage and Bethany. He tells two of his disciples to go to that sister village. And look what it says. Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Now understand what's going on here. In the ancient days, a king would sit on a mount that no one had ever sat on. No one could ever ride the king's mount. It's just not what you did. Like you might borrow my car and it's not a big deal. But in the ancient days, you would not borrow the king's car. Like it was just for him, right? And so he's saying, get me a colt that no one has ever sat. Why? Because he's about to be coronated by the people as the long-awaited king. Look what's going on. It says, if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Basically, if somebody stops you, says, why are you stealing my colt? Okay. He says, I want you to answer like this, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosen the colt? You'd want to know too. You're stealing my colt, right? And so he answers just exactly the way the Lord said, the Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. They are literally laying out the red carpet, rolling out the red carpet for Jesus. They recognize who he is. And they're laying their clothes down before him. They're laying palm branches before him. They're crowning him king, the long-awaited king of the prophesied Jews. He says then he was now drawing near to descend from the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Picture the biggest pep rally you have ever seen in your life. Picture in your mind's eye perhaps the Chiefs pep rally after they win the Super Bowl. Thousands and thousands of people are lining the street. It's about a quarter mile down through the Kidron Valley as he descends off the Mount of Olives up the other side where he goes into the eastern gate of the city and there are Passover pilgrims from all over the Roman Empire. Thousands and thousands of Jews have come to celebrate the Passover and it's that they understand who he is and they're lining the street and they're embracing him as the Messiah, and they understand that he is in fact the king. They've heard about Jesus. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Surely this must be the Messiah. And when they see him coming on the colt, they know exactly what that means. This is Jesus, the fulfillment of the prophecies. Now listen carefully. By entering Jerusalem, on the back of the donkey's colt, Jesus was showing himself that he is the promised Messiah. Hey, a lot of people today say, well, Jesus never even claimed to be God. He never claimed to be the Messiah. They misunderstood. No, there's no misunderstanding this. By him doing this, he is announcing to them that I am, in fact, the Messiah. Century after century, Jewish prophecy after prophecy prophesied that one day a Savior King would come that would reverse the curse of Adam's sin over all of creation over and over again. Century after century, prophecy after prophecy promising God's Son, the promised one. One day he's going to come, and now he's saying, I am the one. And by coming into Jerusalem on the back of this donkey's colt, he is announcing that he is in fact the fulfillment of this prophecy 600 years BC. In the same way, we know we're in the season of Christ's second coming by fulfilled prophecies that have been fulfilled. Just in the last century, the Jews of the first century understood they were in the season of the Christ coming. And one of the prophecies they were looking for is Zechariah 9 and verse 9. 600 years earlier, the prophet wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
So now they see Jesus on this colt, the foal of a donkey, and they embrace him now as the king. He's here. The king has come, the promised one. Now they should have been paying attention because being on the back of a donkey should have told them why he was there. They were hoping for a military general, a king that would go to war. But understand, Jesus did not come at this time for war. He came to peace. Listen, a donkey or a mule was the mount of a king in times of peace, where a horse in the ancient days was the mount of a king in times of war. And so by Jesus coming into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey instead of a horse, what was he telling the people? Jesus was coming to make peace, not war. He hadn't come to make war. He'd come to make peace. Romans 5 and verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Why had Jesus come? Because we were at war with God. Did you know that sin makes war on God? Sin is rebellion against God, which means we come into this world, not the friend of God, not in the family of God, but the New Testament teaches we're estranged from God, that we're the enemy of God. And Jesus came the first time for this reason, to make peace with God on our behalf. It was 2 Corinthians 5, 21 that would say, he traded places with us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But the problem is the people didn't want a king of peace. They wanted a king of war. What they were hoping for was a military general who would make conquest, literally, a military campaign against the Roman incursion and the Roman subjugation. They thought they were embracing him, that he would return then the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel. But understand, Jesus was coming not yet as a military general to make conquest, literally, physically, and throw off the Roman subjugation. He was making peace with God. God on our behalf. All right, now listen very carefully. When he comes again, he will be riding on a white horse. Because the first time he came as a king of peace, to make peace. The second time he's coming as a king to make war. It says in Revelation 19, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Some of you know that, some of you don't, some of you just acting like you didn't hear. Revelation 19, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. And out of his mouth shall proceed a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he treads out the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God. You see, the first time he came to make peace. The second time he's coming to make war. The first time he came for a cross. The second time he's coming for a crown. The first time he came to suffer. The second time he's coming, he's coming to conquer. And he's going to establish a kingdom that will be without sin, that will be without in. Now listen, had the Jews embraced him instead of crucifying him, he still would have gone to the cross. He would have been crucified by the Romans as an upstart king. He would have resurrected from the dead, having died for our sin and rose again. The difference is he would not have ascended back into heaven. They wanted a king that would make war on the Romans and establish his own kingdom. Instead, they would have got that. But because they crucified him, God has temporarily called a timeout to this kingdom plan. But understand, listen very carefully, God's plan for man has been delayed by sin, but it has not been denied by sin. God will have his kingdom. And one day the king is going to come. And in fact, he's going to reign over the nations literally and physically, forever and ever and ever, amen. That's good news. That's good news. But listen carefully. Jesus was coming the first time to reverse the curse of sin, to make peace with God, to be a peace offering before God. He didn't go on the horse the first time. He'll ride into Jerusalem on the back of a horse the second time. No, this time he's on the foal of a donkey because he's telling the people, I've come as a king to make peace. Now look at what happens next, Luke 19, 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him and from the crowd and said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now remember, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the Jews. They hated Jesus. Uh, They were envious of him. They were jealous of him. Like if Jesus is the Messiah, that means he's in charge. Where does that leave us? Right? 
And so they're also in the crowd, but they're not cheering. Where other people are cheering, they're jeering. And they call to him from the crowd and say, Rabbi, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I mean, they understood the people are embracing Jesus as the Messiah. And they're like, Jesus, tell them to stop. But Jesus doesn't tell them to stop. Look how Jesus responds right here. He says in in verse 40, but he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You know what Jesus is teaching? He's teaching this. If you really know who Jesus is, you can no more stay silent about it than the stones themselves could begin to cry out. It is as impossible for dead stones to cry out as it is for a true member of the kingdom of God that's been made alive by the resurrected son of God to stay silent about being alive when they've been dead. It's impossible. One of the marks of someone who's truly been born again, that's what Jesus said, you must be born again. When you put your faith in him, he gives life to your spirit that was dead and you have to tell somebody. Hey, this is what happened to Colin. This is what I love about Colin's story. Colin's life change didn't begin with his life that was changed. It begins with his brother's life that was changed. Colin's brother suddenly finds life in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he immediately has to tell somebody about it. He immediately finds his family and starts sharing the good news of the gospel with them. It's what Jesus is teaching. Listen, when you know who Jesus is, it's impossible to stay silent about it, as impossible as it would be for stones themselves to suddenly cry out. Listen, if you know Jesus, you've got to cry out. Bring him glory. Bring him honor. Tell the world about his love, his mercy. And that's the simple reality that apart from Christ, we are born spiritually stone dead. We are dead spiritually, stone cold dead. It's impossible to cry out if you're a stone, cold, dead person, never, ever been born again. And this is the condition of every single person before they find Christ. I have a rock in my pocket. The stone has no life. It's just a rock. It can't cry out. It has no breath. It has no heartbeat. It has no mind of its own. It is stone dead. Listen, apart from Christ, this is your condition, alive physically, but dead spiritually. You have no ability, no capacity to bring God glory. You see, the first time you're born physically alive, but spiritually dead, this is what happened because you were in Adam when Adam sinned. Romans 5 and verse 12, it says, as by one man's sin, that's Adam, death entered the world, so death passed on all men, for all have sinned. You see, you come into this world physically alive, but spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. I have a bucket of rocks clear across this platform, wherever you're watching from, whatever campus, there's a bucket of rocks across that platform and whatever church house you're watching from, there's some rocks in that church house your church house leader has brought. You know why? Because this pictures all of us apart from Christ. You're dead. You're dead as a box of rocks. I didn't say you're dumb as a box of rocks. But some of us know somebody like that. Don't point. Don't point. <laughs> Not dumb as a box of rocks, well, some of us, but not all of us. But dead as a box of rocks, right? Now, here's what happens. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, that which was dead and had died is resurrected alive. I want you to see today what God wants for all of us. What God wants for all of us is no longer to be a dead rock. He wants all of us to now be a living stone in Christ who makes us spiritually alive. No longer are we dead stones. Now we become living stones. And did you know this is the exact imagery that the apostle Peter would use when he said these words in 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as living stones, no longer dead stones, but living stones are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The dead has now become the living. Now listen, the problem is so many dead people are looking for life among dead things. The entire world is looking for the living among the dead. This was Colin. Did you hear his story? He says, before Christ, he said, I was looking for life in drugs, alcohol, and sexual pleasure. You see, when we turn to sin instead of him, what are we doing? We're looking for the living among the dead. 
All sin is a dead thing. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. All sin can do is bring more death. It cannot bring life. So when you turn to sin instead of him to find life, you're looking for life among dead things and dead things can only keep dead things dead. It can't make it living. You see, the problem with sin is it doesn't simply make you bad, it makes you dead. But when you put your faith in Jesus, all of a sudden, the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave and resurrected him to life is the same power that comes to live inside of you and suddenly it resurrects your spirit that was dead, so now you are alive. A living stone that can cry out and give God glory. Now, this stone I have is dead but I have written a name on it. Not gonna tell you the name, but it's a name of someone God placed on my heart personally. It's a name I'm gonna be praying for between now and Easter Sunday. And the reason there's these bucket of rocks on this platform, a bucket of rocks out here at the base of the terrace if you're in the Lee Summit Auditorium, or a bucket of rocks somewhere near you wherever you're watching from, is because I want you to start thinking of that one Remember what Jesus said, I will leave the 99 and go after the one. And God has put a one in all of our lives. If you have been found, that means now you need to find the one, someone who is still a dead rock, a dead stone that has no life eternally, life physically, no life eternally. You're gonna have a chance this Sunday to go get a dead rock. I want you to write that person's name on that rock and I want you to pray for that person for the next four weeks leading up to Easter weekend. I'm gonna put this rock in my pocket. I'm gonna carry it around every single day and every time I feel it, it's gonna remind me to pray for that person that that dead stone will one day become a living stone that very, very soon God would give life to them the way God has brought life to me. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. And when you're alive, you've got to cry out. You've got to tell somebody. That's the mark of somebody who's been born again that's truly forever now alive. This is what Jesus said. I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones immediately would cry out. And if you're a living stone, listen, you were once a dead rock. Now you're a living rock. God wants to make you a rock star for Jesus, for Jesus. That's what I want to talk about, all right? Well, not being a rock star, but I mean a rock star for Jesus, if you're going to be one, okay? You were a dead stone, now you're a living stone. How do we cry out as a living stone and bring glory now to Jesus, to draw other people to Jesus? Listen, I could go on and on. I could give you a list of 25 ways that we do this now as living stones. I'm only going to give you two. Here's two. Number one is this. We put his love on display through giving generously. Through giving generously. It's one of the core values of our church, generosity. Giving away what God has given us. When you live generously and you give generously in a world full of selfishness and self-centeredness, listen carefully, it's what Jesus called the light of the world, that they would see your good works and glorify God in heaven. You see, the reality is people don't care what we say, what impacts them or what they see. And this is ultimately what impacted Colin. Colin uh, had a vision of some kind where God shows him an angel and he was impacted by what he saw. Now listen carefully, if you're far from God, don't wait to come to faith in Jesus till he shows you an angel in the sky. Don't, because it might not happen that way for you. Here's the reality, the only sign you need to see is that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago died, he spent three days in the grave, and three days later he rose from the dead. That's the number one sign and the only sign you need to see that Jesus died for your sin and he rose from the dead. I want you to know one of the ways we put God's love on display is through generosity. At this very moment, we're renovating 1820 Cherry, an 1890s firehouse to finish out our Crossroads campus. And the reason we're able to do that is because so many of you have given so sacrificially financially, your generosity is making dreams a reality. Now here's the simple truth, we all have some dollars. Some have a lot, some have less, but we all have something. And you should be praying about how to use those dollars for destinies. Chris and I did this at the beginning of the year. We actually increased our tithe, not because we have more money, but because 
we have an opportunity to take those dollars and turn them into destinies. This is what we do. So I challenge you in some way, begin to pray. Most people are just kind of a tipper. They tip God and kind of give what they can, how they can. But I challenge you to begin to pray honestly and ask God, how can I use my resources in a way that will impact eternity? If you're not giving anything, start to give something. If you're giving something, take a step of faith and increase, because here's the simple truth. Our dollars become destinies when we use them for kingdom priorities. One of the things we're gonna do, we ran this play beginning in COVID, and it's an impact play, and you can do this wherever you are in the world. It's something we call Tip Your City. So two weeks from today, actually three weeks from today, Palm Sunday, March the 24th, here's the play we're gonna run. We're all gonna come to church together like we always do, and then you're gonna grab your people, your family, your group, you're gonna go to a restaurant of your choice, brunch, Sunday lunch, and then you're gonna tip big. I mean crazy big. And while we're doing Tip KC, if you're in a church house, you can tip Mound Ridge, Kansas, or Belgrade, Montana, or St. Louis, Missouri. Tip your community. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to unleash a tsunami of generosity on our cities and our communities. Imagine. Thousands of us doing this together. People are impacted by what they see. And then what you're going to do is you're going to tip them big, your server, and you're going to invite them to the Easter service of their choice. Give them a card, an invite card, and invite them to come that weekend. And I'm telling you guys, we've done this like three or four years in a row. It is an impact play. It impacts our city when people see God's love on display. All right, now here's the second thing. We put God's love on display through sharing the gospel openly. In the same way Colin's brother immediately shared the gospel with his family. This is the number one thing. And what does that mean? You're going to get a rock today. You're going to write a name on that rock. Somebody you love, somebody you care about, somebody that's far from God. They're still stone cold dead. And you're going to pray very soon that that rock will come to life and become a living stone. Now you need to understand, it might take weeks, it might take months. Colin had to hear it over and over again for six months. That's usually how it happens. It's not one conversation, it's a running dialogue. And then God brought his military chaplain into his life. That's often how God works. You plant the seed, somebody else comes and waters the seed, but then eventually that dead stone comes to life. And here's the reality. It's not simply enough for people to see it. Eventually, we gotta share it. We gotta share the gospel. And this is what Jesus wants to do in you. This is what he wants to do through you. Look at what it says in John 15. This is the last thing Jesus says. He's just hours away from being betrayed, hours away from going to the cross. He could be sharing anything with his disciples. This is what he says to them. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he may give you. I want you to notice what Jesus is saying. You can live a fruitful life. Not just any fruit. Most fruit is temporary. Most fruit will decay. The things of this world will fade away. He says, I want you to have fruit that remains. You know what that is? The souls of men and women. That God has used your life to impact forever. See, a changed life changes lives. Colin's brother's life was changed. But that changed life led to Colin's changed life. Now Colin also is discipling others. That changed life changes others' lives. I'm telling you, a transformed life transforms lives. And this is what God wants for all of us. Listen, if you begin to pray, God, make me fruitful, I will promise that is a prayer that God will always answer. Now, Jesus said, anything you ask of the Father, I will do it if you ask in my name. Now, that verse has been taken so far out of context so many times. Listen carefully. Jesus isn't teaching that if you ask God for a $250,000 a year salary, God's going to do it. Not what Jesus said. No, he's not saying that if you ask the Father for a house with a four-car garage and you ask in Jesus' name, he's going to do it. No, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is fruit that remains. See, not for your little kingdom of rust and dust, but for his kingdom. You can ask any name and anything if it's his kingdom 
not your kingdom, what that means is I'm going to be asking God to save and redeem this man whose name I've written on this dead stone. And what Jesus is saying is we can ask boldly and confidently in his name, Father, would you redeem this precious man? Would you redeem the soul of this man? I am praying in Jesus' name, believing, because you said I can ask anything if it's for your kingdom, God in heaven, if it's for your name and your fame. This is what we're going to be doing for the next four weeks leading up to Easter weekend, that God would bring an end times harvest. Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest. And I'm telling you, while we're doing it here, there are others doing it around the world over and over again. Invite that person then to Easter weekend. This is the moment where you're apt to get them to church like no other moment in the entire church calendar. So be thinking about who that is. And you need to know, while we're doing it here, others are doing it around the world. We have two members of our church that are permanently uh, living somewhere in South Asia, taking the gospel to those who have never ever heard, while well, we're doing it here, uh, a team of 13 from our church went to minister with them over the last 10 days. They just got back. Before they got back, they sent us a video. I want to share this video with you. Because they were going to this really remote village. They thought they would get to that village and the gospel had never been there that nobody had ever heard. But by the time they got there, they realized a neighboring village had taken Jesus to that village, and I want you to see these living stones, these little stones, crying out, giving Jesus glory. The stones cannot stay silent. When you've been a dead stone and become a living stone, you can't help but cry out. You know what John the Revelator sees in Revelation chapter 7? One day we will stand around the throne of God of every tongue, tribe, people, and nation, worshiping Him forever exalting the Savior. And God wants to use you. God wants to live through you. This isn't just for a few. It's what I used to think. And then over 25 years ago, I began to pray, God, would you make me fruitful? God, would you use my life to impact another? And I can promise if you begin to pray that way, God is going to use you in the way that Colin's brother was used to reach him. And now God is using Colin to reach others also. A chain reaction of transformation. The stones crying out together. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock p.m. If you're in the Kansas City Metro, Lee Summit Campus, if you're in a church house, join us online. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be worshiping, we're going to be praying, we're going to be proclaiming, we're going to be specifically petitioning God for Easter weekend, a move of God, that all of these names that we've written on these stones that we have prayed for all month long, that their eyes will be opened, that God would redeem them and bring them redemption, salvation. That's tonight. That's what we're praying for. I've asked four other pastors from our area to come. You know why? Because we cannot simply be about the abundant life kingdom. We need to be about the Jesus kingdom. His kingdom come. This isn't just for our church. It's not about our church. It's about the church. Listen, we need to see revival come to the church, not just ours, but everywhere where the name of Jesus is preached. We're going to be praying that God would be redeeming thousands and thousands and tens of thousands and thousands. Would you come tonight and praise and pray? It's what we're doing together right here in this auditorium. Praying for that one that you're gonna write on your stone. Praying for revival. I'm gonna pray right now and as I do, whatever campus you're at, I want you to get up out of your seat. I want you to walk and get a stone. Today sometime, I want you to write a name on it. Church houses from Mound Ridge, Kansas to Cedar Falls, Iowa to Quebec, Canada, St. Louis, Missouri, Jeff City, Missouri, wherever you are, there's a stone there. 
I want you to write a name on that dead stone that one day, very soon, God will make that name among the living. Jesus, I pray right now for a move of God, indescribable, undeniable. I lift up this stone to heaven with the name of this man that currently is dead in sin with no hope of heaven, currently going to a Christless eternity. God in heaven, that you'd shake him, that you'd awaken him, that his eyes would be open very, very soon, that you give life to the dead, that he'd become a living stone very, very soon. And I pray for every other stone today in that name. In Jesus' name, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.